Well, boys and girls, today is this is number one of five. Yes, if I knew how to do a spinner Rooney, I would. I bet you SWE WB could do one. Uh, this is from the pot with Don Kincaid and my very special guest, SWB Slick Wagner Brown. My man, thank you so much for spending the time with us on Sir and the Pot. Uh, you're welcome, brother. Now, uh, to, to start all of this off, you could pull a sp- uh, spinner Rooney off, couldn't you? I'll let Booker do that. I don't know. No. Let me <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. Uh, so we got a pack Sunday ahead of us, and we got some really cool talent that I've been talking to. But I like to talk to referees, announcers, managers. We have a guy who's an active wrestler, uh, a veteran wrestler, been in the game, very respected wrestler. Not only that, he does promoting. And he's got a a company that's running called Tesla Strength Wrestling. And what we like to do here, we pull back the curtain maybe a little bit. Uh, We kind of talk about SWB, his upcomings, if you will, uh, what he's doing now. Uh, all of that cool stuff. We love to talk character storylines. We just kind of hang out and talk to the fans and get to know you a little bit better, you know? Right, right. So, uh, with the whole mess going on, you, the fam, the the little man, the champ, everybody's good, right? Everybody's good, man. Everybody's healthy. Thank God. So, same with you, I hope, right? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I got little Jacob over there creating havoc out in the other room, trying to figure out what the heck to do over there, but... uh, yeah, we're doing really good over here. And uh, man, so because I love wrestling so much, that's why I kind of wanted to reach out to the men and women because we're all kind of cooped up right now. Well, you're outside. I'm a little cooped up right now. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, Slick Wagner Brown, I, I don't even know where to start because there's so much to talk about. And I, I know we're only going to scratch the surface today. Uh, so maybe we can have a follow up down the road. You never know, you know, maybe we, because we love these little soirees on Skype. Um, so I'd like to start with I'm just going to jump right into Test Your Strength. I know we want to talk about Slick Wagner Brown, but I love Test Your Strength so much. And you are the one who's brought it to the helm, the forefront. And yourself and Alex Rojas and the men and women you have that are uh, training and wrestling in the school. You guys give us some amazing times. And I swear I heard a notification coming in. That is my fault. I'm not that bright. We all know that. Uh, but Test of Strength, could you tell the fans a little history of Test of Strength, how it came, where it's located, all of that good jazz so the people that don't know of Test of Strength can get introduced to Test of Strength? Um, well, it was like 2015. Uh, as you guys know, I've been wrestling for a long time. And I've seen a lot of, you know, good stuff and bad stuff and everything in between. And I just felt like creating uh, another a company that would reflect how I see, how I believe wrestling should be presented and just giving people an, op- an op- options, right? And, uh, you know, so I've taken, like, you know, a lot of the good stuff that I've seen in my travels and applied it to um, TOS. And, you know, a lot of things from personal experiences and a lot of things that I've seen with my own two eyes. So, you know, thankfully uh, it's going well. And, you know, uh, I started out with just a dojo. So it was just just training. And uh, my very first student, very first sign up was Ty Shine. We love yeah. Ty Shine. Uh, now, Speaking of Ty Shine, because <laughs> I've seen that we, we go to all the training days, all the big shows, but at the training days, you guys have a lot of fun. Uh, not, not that you don't at the big shows, but at the training days, when Ty Shine is doing his thing in the ring, he kind of grabs a move or two or three or four or seven or 12 from one Mr. Slick Wagner Brown. And you like to jazz him a little bit about that. Me as a yeah. fan, I love that shit. I think it's the most <laughs> hilarious stuff. And not only you. But, like, a couple of the students that are actively working or what have you, even Mr. Rojas loves to cut a promo every now and then. We all know that. Uh, Yeah. Seeing a guy, guy, Ty Shine, first student in the TOS, uh, uh, as they say, uh, homage to Slick Wagner Brown. That's got to feel good in your heart to see that kind of thing, though, right? 
Yeah, yeah, I, you know, it's it's cool, you know. Um, on the flip side, like, I, I, I'm i glad, like, you know, his, his attitude has been the shits lately, but I'm <laughs> glad that, you know, um, over time that these guys, including Ty, have, like, found themselves, you know. I, I look forward yeah. to those moments, you know. It's cool. We're all guilty of it. When we start out wrestling, we want to, you know, wrestle like our favorite wrestlers or whatever, mm -hmm. but... You know, you have to find yourself eventually, and and I think he has done that, and he's done a great job. He absolutely has, and I'm not saying that he's taken everything that Slick Wagner does in the ring and mimics it, but right. I mean, again, you guys have some fun with that. I mean, and, and again, I crack up every single time. Uh, now, <clears throat> you have said uh, mentioned that Ty Shine's attitude as of lately uh, has been the shits, is the shits. Yeah, uh, yeah. we the fans. Wow, I think we were all very shocked. Now, test of strength, when the fam sees that in the back, are they as shocked as we are? Do they know? Because, I mean, it's behind the curtain a bit. Is that something that was kind of maybe said or mentioned that was going to possibly happen? Or was everybody in the back a fan and watching this go down and the surprises as the fans were? They and they are. I, I try to keep that stuff the same, you know, like I like I like a good surprise. Uh, that's the biggest part of wrestling for me. I love surprises. Um, it's one of the draws, right? It's one of the things that draws me to it. When something happens that you don't expect or you didn't anticipate or you don't see coming, it's, it's a beautiful moment. It's something that you remember forever, you know, because it makes you feel something. I love that part of wrestling. That's why I don't read the dirt sheets. I don't follow all of the stories on, you know all of these websites or what have you. Um, I love being a fan and being surprised. That right. awe moment, that shock moment when those little things happen, those are those things we talk about. Like my dad, I take him to all the shows. Uh, those are those things we talk about on the way home. Oh, my right. God, Pop. You remember blah, 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 blah. And then he starts going, yeah, well, he's yeah. a fucking yeah. asshole. He shouldn't have <laughs> did that to blah, 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 blah. You, you know, and so we really have fun on that. Those are those things, though. When right. we leave a show, we get those. Those. See, I talk about it right now, Slick, and I get goosebumps just talk about wrestling like that. Um, right. You uh, seem as you're as you're teaching your students and trying to show them, you know, your way, uh, uh, the Kowalski way, because we're definitely going to get into that. Uh, yeah. You have to. You're still a fan through and through, like 110 percent, aren't you? Yes, sir. I've been doing this for over two decades, man. And uh, you have to be a fan on this level, especially because, as you know, the money is not there. Right. We're not we're not getting rich on this level. And we're not doing it for the money. So the ones that survive on this level, you can't question their their passion and, and their love of the business, because there's is there really any other reason to do it <laughs> on this level? It there is not, you have put it so eloquently in this little small ball right there, sir, because just like I, I take music and wrestling and kind of correlate them together because they're so uh, very familiar to each other on many levels. And that's yeah. the same thing. Local band, you're not in it for the money. You're up on yeah. that live stage. You're doing your thing. The friends, the family, the new friends you make out at the club scene. That's why yeah. you do it. That's that just that urge and that that feeling you get when you're performing live dude there's nothing like it uh, that's an energy a unique energy it, yeah. it is and everyone now, everyone loves the way that makes them feel and how it makes the people that are watching feels i i could do it for a quarter i could do it for a hundred bucks i could do it for five bucks yeah. i could just yeah. do it and get out there you know um right. i don't mean to to compare it to the fact to where this is the major difference that I've kind of really never pointed on between music and wrestling, getting on that live stage, getting in the ring, very similar, but I'm not putting my life on the line. I'm not putting my body in harm's way. Maybe right. sometimes if I'm not sounding that well, I can probably use a punch in the face or a bottle <laughs> from him. I can accept that. Yeah. But in general, you men and women are sacrificing injury, uh, your livelihoods on the side, the shoot jobs, if you will, um, if you're doing this for your livelihood, you're, you're, you put that in harm's way. Um, what pushes you men and women so hard? And I know there's a passion. We all get that. But there's got to be something that I'm missing that just triggers you men and women to say, 
fuck this, I'm going back. After a broken leg, after a broken neck, after a broken back. Like, what drives you guys to get back in that ring? Well, I mean, I'll speak from my experience. Like, initially, you don't know anything beyond just getting in the ring, training, and doing, you know, road events. You don't know anything more than that. But once I started, once the world of wrestling started to open up for me, once I started to travel on planes and go to different countries and wrestling abroad, that's when it, you know, it clicked. Like, a wrestling ring has the potential to take you around the world, to change your life, to change other people's lives. Because you don't know who's watching, right? A, a young man or a young woman is, is in the audience watching and gets inspired from seeing you doing what you do. And now they're inspired and now they want to do what you do. And one day they can take it as far as you have or beyond. And that, that's a powerful thing, my friend. The way you just put that is exactly where I'm going to go with this because I mentioned Slick Wagner Brown, test of strength to anybody that I've talked to. May it have been when I started doing the stirring the pots or now I've transitioned to this Skype thing because of what's going on. There is not one bad word. You are so respected in the industry, on the local scene right now. It, I don't know if you're that aware of it because we all, we're all we all our, our worst critic in all of that and, and the whole nine yards. And to be a boss and, and on, on owner of a, uh, of a company and to grow students, sometimes you might get a little slack from it. But my, my friend, you are have to be one of the most respected people that I've ever uh, encountered. And again, your peers, they put you up on a pedestal. And I'm not trying to kiss your ass. I am, I'm just blowing hashtag facts at you right now. Uh, another thing that's always mentioned when I mention your name is your laugh is infectious as it gets <laughs> my friend. Holy shit. That is almost the very first thing anybody <laughs> says is slick yeah. laugh. You could hear throughout the building and you just know you're going to have a good night. Uh, yeah. Making a lot of friends, the men and women, young, old, veterans, uh, no matter what. That's got to put another part, a uh, little nice little warm piece in your heart right there, no? Yeah, man, it feels good, you know. Uh, <laughs> I, I appreciate that, you know. Um, it, it wasn't always like that, so <laughs> it's, it's good. Yeah. Hey. It, wrestling is a rough gig. We all know that. I mean, you guys know that better than I do, but yeah. uh, wrestling is a rough gig and it does take a little bit in transition and evolution of character, if you will. We talk a lot about character on Stir in the Pot and your character right now is very loved by every single... I've, I've never heard a boo, not one time in any show, anywhere I've gone and seen you. And I've seen you at a couple of promotions. I need to see you at yeah. more. I need to travel more. You travel like a motherfucker. I mean, I don't yeah. travel as much as you do. But uh, <laughs> I really, that, um, is that come easy for you? Because the baby face or the, the good guy portion of the program is not the easiest part to really elevate on. The villain, I'm um, to understand, is a lot easier because you can shit talk to anybody and it just comes right, right. back at you. Uh, it's easy, it's bringing, easy to hate somebody. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, was it hard for Slick Wagner to get, I mean, obviously you've been in the game for a while, but was yeah. it easy to yeah. get us on board with what you're doing? Um, so when I, when I go back to when I started, I mean, um, you know, uh, training with Kowalski and all, like he was very ahead of his time. So he, he taught reality wrestling before reality wrestling was cool. And not everyone was, was with it, but I was one of those guys that appreciated it because to me it was different. So if I'm doing something different than the other guys, then that means people are going to remember me and hopefully talk, talk about me and hopefully remember my name. That's the ultimate goal. So I want them when they leave to remember my name um, because that will make them want to follow me somewhere else and buy a ticket to see me again. And um, it's, it's just, so I, I've always done things differently. So people, when they see me, they're like, wow, that's different. So one of the first things was, like, my music. So every, at the time when I came into wrestling, everyone came out to rock music. So I came out to rap music because no one else was doing it. Um, then everyone started coming out to rap music, and I flipped it and came out to reggae and rap mix, which I love the most. And that's, a, that's the first part of your character that the people get is your entrance music before they even see you. 
And now I think with my music, when people hear it, they, they, they already know that it's me. And that's the goal. And that's, that's a beautiful thing. It's, that's another thing that we speak of is when the music hits, sometimes you don't know who it is from company to company when they're moving around because you're not so familiar with that. Or maybe they've used a couple different theme musics for whatever reason, or theme, theme entrances. Yeah. Um, uh, but you're, <laughs> as soon as emergency goes off, there is one person in particular that I have to, and you know where I'm going with this. Oh, I yeah. have to talk about Fogman will just sound off louder than your music. Yeah. He, I think he does it on purpose because he <laughs> wants to make sure that he gets that domino effect going for SWB. He loves SWB so much, man. And as yeah. soon as your music yeah. starts, dude, <laughs> Fog is overtaking it vocally. Uh, I'm seeing you smile. You and Foggy got a his yeah, 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 you do. Yeah. I hear him right now, right? You, you can hear his voice in your head right now. Yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> uh, seeing you smile just talking about Fog makes me warm and giggly all inside. Talk to us, the fans, about your relationship with the Fog Man. So the first time I met Foggy was in Wallingford, Connecticut. Uh, Tony Rumble, um, rest in peace. He did uh, he did an event in Connecticut and Wallingford at a Toyota dealership on uh, Route 5. So that's the first time I ever met Foggy. It was an outdoor event, and it was one of my first events. I was probably like less than a year in. So he's been supporting me and been a fan of me for that long. So he's, he's been on that ride for, you know, 20-plus years as well. And and I respect and appreciate that. I, I love my fans. Foggy will and, – and if I don't – if I don't – um. If I don't do the call letters, SWB with him, he'll be he'll always even give me something. He's like, come on, Kincaid, what are you doing? Wake up. You know, like he almost That's feels a like a gym. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, like I when he wasn't able to make an event at uh, Survivor Championship Wrestling specifically, yeah. I kind of took that role for him because yeah. this was a debut show of S of SCW. And the crowd yeah. was really there. They came out for that show, but not all of them knew what to do with each person. So right. I kind of tried to do those little things when the guys would come out. And I, <laughs> I was right there. I was like, this is for you, Foggy, SWB. Yeah. And, yeah. I, and I let that charge, baby. <laughs> I, remember. I remember that. Thank you, Don. Appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. But that's what we do as fans, uh, uh, Mr. Brown, is, uh, you know, and I know I sound formal and everything, but I love to just be respectful to all the men and women because you guys, I'm a guy with a phone who shows up and I get in your face and I get back to the king. I mean, are you fucking kidding me? Who wants that jazz? You guys seem to really love that shit and respect what I do. So I always, always, always have to be respectful when I talk to you guys because, hey, man, I'm just a fan with a phone who's gained some really uh, valuable, uh, honored relationships with you guys and networked with some fantastic people. So when I say Mr. Brown or, you know, Mr. F Mr. Bricks, and I say Mr. Bricks not willingly, by, might I add, uh, <laughs> I just try to be respectful, you know? Yeah, you don't have to call me Mr. Brown, man. You can say Slick, SWB, whatever you want. <laughs> uh, now I see that you, you're sporting the cool, the cool swag. You guys got some really yeah. cool stuff out there. Yeah. Uh, now, test your strength. The evolution of test your strength. Could you kind of talk to us a little bit because it started in a different place than it is now. It's moved yeah. on, um, and yeah. now that you guys moved on and built a nice little fan base over there, you've taken it on the road. We, the fans, like to call them the pay per view shows. You yeah. call them the road shows. Road Talk events, to us yeah. about that little evolution, if you will. Well, the goal was always to run events, right? So when, when you're running a dojo and you have uh, your students that you're training to apply the skills that they're learning at, on, you know, dojo events or road events, you need to have events. So we have the dojo events. So initially we started with the dojo events where we had monthly events at the, at the dojo. And, you know, it's a studio setting. So you can fit like 40, 50 people in their max. So it's it's very intimate setting. But if you can work in that type of when you get to a point where you're wrestling in front of thousands of people or 10,000, 60,000, 100,000 people, it's nothing. It's easier. That's easier, believe it or not. 
obviously when you do it for the first time, you're going to be, you know, shaking up a little bit because it's a little nerve wracking. But if you can work in that small environment and get people on board with what you're doing, there is no pyro. There are no lights. There are, there, there, there's nothing, there's no like video montage to get everybody hyped up and educate them to what, you, what you're doing. No, you are all that. You're not on television. So that's you. So every time you go out there, you got to do everything that those things do for you at the big event. So if you can do that, then that's going to be a thousand times easier. I think that's what really drew me to Test Your Strengths from the very first time I went there was it's such an intimate setting. It's a room with a ring with a few chairs. And yeah. my word, we have such an amazing time. But the point being is that wrestling is hard to pull off in a very tight setting like you were just talking about. You've yeah. got to be on. The pressure is on right in front of that tight-knit crowd because we can hear everything that's going on for the most part. We don't hear everything, obviously, but we hear a lot of the stuff that's going on. And it's such yeah. an tight environment that, you know, the sound effects on in the ring, it's amplified than if you're at a bigger show or even a bigger building, if you will. Um, yeah. That environment is just so cool. But not only that, you've got a hard cam that sits up at the top and you get them all ready for that whole thing, you know? Without, right. like you're saying, the glitz and the glamour, the production of it. I yeah. think that's the coolest thing that you bring all of that into that one little room. Right, right. And that's, it's, a, it's a challenge. But that the, you just mentioned the hard camera. Like, I don't know what other people are doing, but when you get to the big dance, you know, the higher up you get on that ladder and you start wrestling for TV companies, you got to know how to work the camera. So you got to mm -hmm. know where the hard camera is and, you know, you gotta you gotta know how to do your stuff where the camera catches it, because more people are gonna see you online, technology than ever in person. So you need to be able to do things in a way that will maximize your your efforts. And and that's leading to the big stage. And yes. that's, that's that's starting here uh, yes. with your students. You know, and, and I'll name some names, which I won't I won't care to name a bunch. The Elijah Six. <sighs> The Eliza Sixes, uh, the Jay, the Jay Brickses, and and the Sammy, the Sammy Diazes, and all those. Guys. I'll have to say Richard Stone because uh, I mean for real though. Uh, but you take these students, you mold them, and you mold them, but they make their characters. That's what I love. You say, okay, what do you want to do? Because I'm not telling you what to do. You've got to use your creativity. You've got to use your mind. They give you ideas, then you kind of work with that. Am I am I correct on saying that or no? Yeah, so, like, we don't do, um, like, uh, oh, I have this character in mind, and, oh, this guy just walked in. Hey, you're going to do that character. It doesn't it doesn't work that way because it's not natural. So I kind of, like, let the guys do their thing, and I, I observe them, and I wait to see that moment where that, that character comes out, and I can identify it and go, that's it, and let's build on that. And I think that's part of the reason why, you know, people like the firm, and, and a lot, you know, are successful because it's them, but the volume is turned all the way up. So like Richard Stone, for example, like when he first came to the dojo, when Rich first came to the dojo, he was, you know, vanilla, right? He was, he was going to be like a hero and there was really nothing there. Fundamentally, he was good, but there wasn't anything to sink your teeth into. So like, Bobby's assistant trainer, Bobby Ocean's assistant trainer at the dojo. So one day when he was training, he had these guys film. Uh, it was like a therapy session, I guess. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. What, what, but, you know, it kind of reminded me of that. And, and they recorded it. So uh, Bobby sent it to me. And I saw the footage with, with Stone doing a promo as like a lawyer. Like, you know, his promo style was like a lawyer. And I was like, that's it. Right? That that made me interested and you know how i like to measure things is like if we're if the boys are interested in something then you the fans will definitely be interested in something because we're a lot of us are jaded we've been doing right. it a long time or you know naturally you just like to hate on something for whatever reason you just like ah that mm -hmm. sucks so if, if especially if that person goes that's money you know you have <laughs> something yeah <laughs> 
uh, the four of them, and I speak of the firm a lot on these uh, stirring the pots. I'd rather not, but I have to, uh, <laughs> because I, I, I mean, in all honesty, those four singly tag team, all four of them, it doesn't matter. But the four of them have gained their, they've gained their identity, if you will, at this point in their career, they have uh, as young as they all are at that which time. Is, because, which, yeah, which is a big crazy. advantage. Big advantage. Yeah. Yes. How yes. crazy yes. is that? That they they have these identities, and not only at Test of Strength. This is this is the big kicker right here. When they can go to Shut Up and Wrestle, when they can go to PAPW, when they can go to Bell Time Club, and they can go abroad at XWA Center, and make fans like me and the and the people at Test of Strength that are very familiar with them that love to boo the shit out of them, they get yeah. that same heat. No matter where they go, man, it's amazing. Whatever you've done to these guys, and I know they take it on their own and, and start working it on their own, but I'm telling you, Slick, you are creating some magic at the Test of Strength Dojo, and it's just talking about the four guys from a firm alone. Never mind everybody else you got going on. Those guys alone, right. man, money, fire, uh, yeah. whatever you want to call it. Holy crap. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, man. Thank you, and. You know, it's it's uh, again, like I'll I'll say something to those guys, or Alex will say something to those guys, and and they run with it, right? So like, uh, for example, Rich, Richie Stone's uh, outfit. Um, <laughs> the, the sweat the sweatpants deal. It's 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 diff it's different. The uh, the whole get up is different, and and you know he goes out and he runs with that, and then he goes an extra step. So I go, man, just make your shit as obnoxious as possible. So when people say it, they're like, what the F is this guy? Oh, my God. Give me a break. I can't stand this mother F. I just like punch him in the face. That's what you are. <laughs> uh, his, his bits are simply amazing every single time because now we've kind of taken uh, the, the Smurf chant and it's trickled in a couple more places. And I yeah. am loving that. And he hates it, but he loves to retaliate with us. And we're doing that dance between wrestler and fan. And my God, is it working something fierce. And it's so much fun. Uh, like when him and uh, Jay Brooks well, are going to shop and wrestle. When's the, last, when's the last time you've seen a character in wrestling that has a weasel character that people actually <laughs> love to get behind and actually believe it? Yeah. Right, Bobby Heenan is the last character that I know of that had that kind of weasel character and it got so much heat and people were yeah. caught up into it. So that's a good thing. A lot of people don't want to play that role, but if the money is there, what are you going to do? you going to walk away from it? And it's so natural, too, because whenever he came out with that damn suit of his, I was like, what the hell is that powder blue suit doing? He's like, it's power blue, Kincaid. And that's man, right. what a <laughs> what a line that is. I love that one. Yeah. Power blue. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, man. Those guys are so much fun, man. But that's what we talk about, though. Uh, Storylines, characters, without the combination of both and the ring prowess at the same time, there's a, lose, there's a lost element in all of that. So, again, what you're doing at Test of Strength, it's absolutely money. But you talked about Killer Kowalski, and I'd kind of like to touch upon that because that's a huge name in wrestling. Yeah. Very respected yeah. name. And his name is global right now yes. from e even in the past years with yourself, with the dojo, and many others carrying on that lineage, if you will, which Mr. SOG loves. He swears by that Kowalski lineage. You know, I know SOG, when <laughs> he talks lineage, you better listen. But anywho... Yeah. Uh, Talk to us about Killer Kowalski and what he really did for you to mold you as a wrestler. Well, I was I was a 15 year old little scrawny kid from you know Boston, Mass, and um, my one of my uh, best friends growing up, Bo Douglas, Bo knows. Uh, he uh, found about out about Kowalski, so we we used to wrestle, we used to mess around in in the in the basement in the backyard. And then we started doing stuff at the local boxing clubs. And he wanted to take it legit. He wanted to take it to the next level. And he said, you know, if I find a, a, a place for us to train, would you be interested in, in doing it? 
I was like, hell yeah. If you find a place that we can train, I'm down. I'll be right there with you. And he found Kowalski's in Walden, Mass. I couldn't believe it, you know. There was, <laughs> it, it's not, wrestling schools and stuff weren't ex, as accessible as they are today. So he found out about it in a wrestling magazine. And uh, we went there. We took the bus and went there. And uh, the moment you opened the, the door, it was on the second floor. So you'd open the door downstairs and you'd walk up the steps. They'd be creaking, <laughs> old creaky steps. And you would hear the guys getting slammed and screaming and, and you know, in pain. And you're like, what the F is going on up there? <laughs> so at, at that moment, you're like, okay, I got two choices. I can either take the next step and keep climbing or I can turn around and get the hell out of Dodge. So, you know, we kept climbing. We went up there. We saw Walter sitting in the chair observing everything. We introduced ourselves and, you know, we told him that we'd love to, you know, we're big fans of pro wrestling and we'd love to take it to the next level if possible. So, you know, at that time, he's like, you guys are 15 years old. You're too young to sign up. So it's kind of like, oh, shit. You know what I mean? But, mm. you know, we kept going. We kept going. He said, you can't sign up till you're 18 years old. So we kept going. So we'd wow. go to the, to the dojo every every week. They trained on, on Tuesdays, Thursdays, Saturdays, and Sundays. And we went all those days like we were already signed up. And wow. he, saw, he saw how driven we were and how passionate we were about it. And he said, you know, once you graduate high school, you guys are more you're welcome to sign up. So the moment we graduated, we paid them, paid our money and started training. Now, to get – you already had three years, basically, maybe a little bit less than two and, two and plus years, already training on a weekly basis, working up to graduating, and then being able to sign up to really – now, how do you turn it up an extra gear after you've already been, you know, ro rolling around and doing those things and learning the bumps and stuff? How do, you, how do you jack it up a little bit more once you graduate? Well, we never got in the ring. So, like, the only thing that we would do is, like, oh. when, they had mat when they had matches, we would referee for them. So we never oh, actually did okay. the physical part. Okay. But we, we, did the, <laughs> we did the mental part, which was observing and, and learning. And people underestimate the, the mental part of what we do. So we learned a lot sitting on the sidelines. Now, the psychology... The mindset, having a good mindset, walking into any match, I don't care if it's a high-profile match, if it's your first match, if it's your 100th match, whatever it is, I, you always have to, that mindset always have to be there, in my opinion, because it takes away from the rest of the package. If you've been working on your body your whole lifetime, you've been working yeah. on your holds and the whole nine yards, without this, it takes a big piece of the package away. Am I, am I correct on saying that? Yeah, so like I always tell the guys that, um, you know, the fans, they can't tell you, they can't explain to you when something is done incorrectly or it's just, it's, it's not connecting. They can't tell you because they're not trained. So the trained eye can do that, but they know when something is not right. You can mm -hmm. feel it and you can see it in the way they respond to things, their reaction, and just the look on their face most times. So, you know, wrestling is about, about reactions man you know so mm. if i'm going out there as a hero and i'm, I'm i want to get cheered and i'm getting booed that's still better than silence <laughs> so you know it's up it's up to me to figure figure it out how do i get them on my side or just be a villain now we yeah now because we, sometimes when you come out men or men or women and say if we've never met you before that's a different uh, story but if you're in the same promotion, you've kind of got a little storyline building. We, the fans, kind of take over from where you thought you were supposed to be coming out as a babyface or a villain. And then all of a sudden, it turns into the opposite. We flip the switch on you. It, it, that's got to be a little bit harder to adapt because you're, you're coming in with, okay, this is my gimmick. This is the way I come in. This is the way the crowd is supposed to react. If they don't, I have to make them react that way. But if, if they don't, what the, what the hell am I doing wrong? But sometimes we just flip the script on you men and women coming out. That's right. got to be a little wacky, right? Yeah. So, like, for example, NWWE, which is uh, uh, Trooper Gilmore's promotion in Rhode Island. Um, so I was a champion. And unfortunately, you know, for other, other uh, reasons, like, you know, whether I was at Immortal or somewhere else, I wasn't able to be there for, like, three events. So when I finally went to defend my title against Dolly Decimo, 
uh, when I came out, they booed the shit out of me. And right, rightfully so, right? I haven't, I haven't been there, and <laughs> I haven't defended my title. So, I, I, you know, I kind of had it in the back of my head where they might do that. And they, they did. And they were absolutely right to do that because, you know, as their champion, I was nowhere to be found. So they booed the shit out of me, and uh, Darley came out and got a, a, a huge pop. And I was like, all right, so they love Darley. They hate me. That's great. So that's what we're going to do. Right, I'm supposed to be the hero, but I am not their hero tonight, and that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> and and you you like playing with both sides, the, the good and the bad, don't you? It's a challenge. I, I love a challenge, especially being in the game for a long time. You 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 love a challenge. So whenever a challenge is presented, I I, I embrace it. Uh, being a villain, you don't always have to use profanity or you know flipping the bird and stuff. Uh, no, you know, and and I and I know we all like to cuss now and then. Do you feel because you are a good guy and mostly every uh, again, I've never seen you booed, so that that was a, a a mind f to me right there. Uh, but when you come out and the fans have booed you, now you have to be a villain. Uh, is it hard to pull back? you know, the profanity or whatever, or it's just, you've done it so long, it kind of comes naturally. You know how to work in the ring and deal with the fans. And it's a challenge. It's easy for anyone to go into someone's face and flip a bird. You know what I mean? That's that's easy. Um, it's easy to go to someone and tell them that their mother is worthless. That's easy. <laughs> so, you know, and it does get you heat and it, get, it gets people to not like you, obviously, but um, it's not a challenge. So uh, to figure out different ways how to get people to do what you want them to do, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, one one of the like Eddie Guerrero when he was in WCW. So Eddie was always like the man in the ring, but you know his character was lacking for a little bit, and in WCW he started to come through where he would walk to the ring and he would like have a smug look on his face, like he's disgusted to be here and. And he would shy away from people, not even touch him. He didn't want people to touch him. And that's going to get you heat. And, and that's just body language. So body language is, is, is the, 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 to me, the best way to do it. You don't have to say, say a word. You don't have to say a word. I, 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 this, that's going to be the name of this episode. Because you <laughs> saying that r- reminds me of somebody. Uh, I was supposed to go see Moonshine McCready. I was very excited to see Moonshine McCready the very first time. It was a PWA event in Cheshire before they went up, went down. Now, yeah. the night before, I drove to XWA in Rhode Island after work to see a, th- a Thursday night throwdown with my dad. I've been yeah. going there for a little bit, made some friends. I go, hey, who's on the card tonight? Somebody goes, Moonshine McCready, and a, a couple other names, you know, and I go, Son of a bitch, I'm supposed to go see him tomorrow. This yeah, is a special yeah. one for me personally. And my dad goes, are you shitting me? We're going to see him both nights. I go, yeah, let's check this shit out, you know. Yeah, Here comes yeah. Moonshine McCready making his debut at XWA, all right? He's got Richard. He comes walking down. The country music is going on. He gets in the ring. He lays in the middle of the rope, you know, like he does before he gets in. And he's all sloshed and shit, you know, drinking out of the jug. Gets yeah. in the ring. Does yeah. his entire match. Walks out, never says one word slick, not one single effing word the entire match. Yeah. I loved it. I absolutely yeah. loved it and couldn't wait to see him the next night at PWA. Yeah. So he made, he made an impression on you. Yes. Without That's saying so. one word. Yeah. That's good. He's an alcoholic. <laughs> <laughs> it, it wouldn't make any sense anyway. <laughs> <laughs> he is an alcoholic. <laughs> oh, man. Allegedly, we don't know what's in that jug. Or yeah, is it, no. it's, moon, it's, moon, it's moonshine, right? I'm I should, hey, I've seen referees sip off of that thing, and they don't like the taste of it either. So I don't know what the hell is in that thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, speaking of referees, uh, holy cow. Uh, man, not only does your students come in and become fine wrestlers, but man, your referee, they take on a role of a referee. Do you find that it needs to be part of the program? Does everybody have to come up as a student to be part, uh, be a referee just to kind of feel what it's like? Is that something that you kind of include? Yeah, they, they have to train and learn the basics of what we do. And 
and they have to know like the psychology of what we do. Uh, because just like basketball, there's a thing called the six man coming off the bench in uh, pro wrestling. There's the, the third man or, or woman or uh, in a tag team situation, it's the fifth person, the fifth man or the fifth woman. You know, you get the picture. So the referee plays a vital role in what we do. <laughs> uh, you, <laughs> you, ref, gee whiz, Ref Bill Thompson, what yes. a fantastic ref. Uh, me and him, very shaky relationship. Uh, when yeah. I did a certain pot with him, I drank moonshine. It was probably my most amazing uh, talking to ref Bill session I've ever had in my life without getting kicked in the shins. It was amazing. Uh, <laughs> but you've got yourself some ref Jordan, very young upcomer. I'm hoping to see some more of that young man. Oh, my word. Uh, yeah. You've got ref, ref Tucker has moved on to be a caddy. for. A caddy. <laughs> oh, oh, my goodness. Uh, yeah. For one, T.J. Howell III, and now he's kind of part of the cold cash. Now, I want to talk about those guys real quick because they're all students of yours. Yes. Uh, all three of them, which is amazing because they make such a great team. Uh, Caddy gets in the ring. T.J. Howell gets down on the ground, does his pose. Ryan Frost comes from behind, the big power guy, and either swings his arm, pushes Caddy, takes his kendo stick and whacks Caddy, Caddy takes a freaking bump across to the wall on the mat yes. through the ropes, no matter what. Yes. Those things crack me up and I lose my shit every time. Can you talk a little bit about those little nuances that you like seeing? Yeah, so um, um, TJ, TJ started with us when we were in Watertown. So we actually started in Waterbury at Norm's Gym. Shout out to Norm's Gym. And Norm, Norm, uh, he gave us a place to start what we're doing. And I always am grateful and appreciate that. And uh, then we moved on to Wartown where TJ joined us. And then we, you know, TJ went through a, a few uh, different personalities while he's been with us. And now he's on uh, TJ Howell the third. So, and that seems to be working for him. And uh, then we moved on to where we are now, which is East Hartford, Connecticut. And that's been home for like three years. So, um, TJ and Ryan decided to, you know, I don't know if I put them together initially uh, in a random tag or if they tagged somewhere else. I, I don't remember, but they came up with a name. And when I heard the name Cold Cash, I was like, that's money. So, there's, there's, some, there's something there. And um, Caddy, Tucker was refereeing for us at the time. And... Uh, I believe TJ showed me a video of like a golfer. We we came up with we came up with Caddy at the dojo, one of our training sessions. Because like there's no there's no so we I I had the idea of making Tucker a manager, and we were trying to figure out you know what the personality would be, and yeah. and we came up with Caddy, and I was like that's money. Now we need to have like a, a personality for the Caddy. So TJ showed me a video of a golfer abusing his caddy and i was like that's <laughs> money <laughs> so you guys you know you now you have a direction it's up to you to to, to yeah. run with that and they and they've done a great job coming up with different scenarios on how to abuse a caddy and i think yeah. it's hilarious uh seeing that creativity though coming from your students you not giving them forcing like you said not forcing an unnatural uh, character or gimmick on them, my word, they are having an amazing time. It's got to be way more fun than trying to be forced to do a character, wouldn't you say? Yeah, well, we did force a character on TJ initially, which is like uh, uh, the uh, State Farm guy. He wasn't feeling it. And I, and I knew, I, I knew he, he wasn't, but it was something for him to do at the moment until he, he, find, he found himself. <laughs> 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 but 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 he, okay. he, like a true pro, he did it though. He didn't like it, but he did it. You you know, I've talked to TJ sitting down at, at uh and stirring the, uh, stirring the pot. But even that shows talking to Mister Howell. You know, he's a little rough around the edges. He likes to bark at people, but he's actually not that bad of a guy. And he we've talked and had some good conversations here and there. And man, you've got yourself one fine young man to go and represent and that's I, i'm going to use that as a key word represent Tessa strength when he goes 
to, you know, Paradise Alley, Battlefront, you name it, wherever he goes, Bell Time, um, XWA, he's always representing TOS. Uh, what do you need from me? I'm a team player. And I've always yeah. found that about TJ Howell. I love that about him as a wrestler. Yeah. Yeah. yeah those guys do a great job. I mean, that's, that's, um, they, they, everywhere, everywhere I go, people talk, you know, kindly about, about those guys. And, and that, that's, that's what it's all about. Cause I tell them all the time, you're not just representing yourself. You represent the dojo and whatever you do, positive or negative, it's going to mm-hmm. fall back on, on the dojo and the guy coming up behind you. So when, mm-hmm. when you go somewhere to do something, whatever it may be, you do it to the best of your ability. Because if you don't, then, you know, they're going to go, well, we don't really need anybody else from that dojo because you know, of this guy. Right. So, so that, that's something to think about. And uh, talking about your students and representing, taking their creativity going to, from company to company and making it really work for themselves. And again, repping the slick, the Kowalski, TOS, all of that. Uh, right. Eliza right. Six, I want to just talk real quick. He's been ripping up signs of children. Uh, lava heat. Holy yeah. shit. Yeah. Is he creating lava heat wherever he's going now? Uh, the ripping up of signs. I feel... It's a lost art because a lot of people, that whole contact thing, you know, the PC stuff and all of that crap. Elijah (laughs) is taking his character and totally running us over like a steamroller right now. Ripping up the signs of children. Holy shit. Talk about heat. And I'm loving every second of it. Oh, my God. It's amazing. Yeah. So um, that's great, man. I I love seeing stuff like that. I love hearing about stuff like that because to me that means they get it and they're and they're getting it so you know once you establish yourself as a villain or a hero when mm-hmm. the bell rings it becomes easy mm-hmm. if you don't do that then you know it's a long day at the office so you know he, he gets it he gets it and uh he he does a good job of, of of getting heat and he understands what he has to do and again like you said earlier these guys are doing these things at an early early stage in the game so, mm-hmm. you know, uh, when I started out, I didn't have anyone to really teach me the psychology of pro wrestling. So they, you know, I, I knew from Kowalski and other guys at the, at the dojo, like Trey, the smooth operating dancer and, and Tim McNamee and Duke Stahl. And these are all guys that were in my, my training class. Like they were ahead of me, but they were still training at the dojo. So in my class personally was guys like John Walters and Louis Ortiz you know, Bo Douglas, obviously, and uh, J, J, uh, J Rage, which became uh, J Rumble. You know, those guys were in, were in my class. But, you know, I learned a lot from those guys physically and, mm-hmm. like, um, how, to, how to do stuff and uh, why you do it, but not necessarily the overall uh, picture or story of pro wrestling. Mm-hmm. Or, which is the psychology of it? They just told me that when, when you're one day you're gonna be out there and you're just gonna get it, right? And uh, you know, I always thought, man, what the fuck? Like, that's not <laughs> that's not like really that that helpful. You know, I don't even know what the hell that means. Um, but it, it did happen. But it took it took a long time between the the time of like five to ten years. So when I, I finally decided to to travel out to uh, California. And uh, check out the um, UPW's dojo at the time, which was a developmental for WWE, uh, WWF back then. Um, and I was blown away by uh, what these guys knew as far as mentally, like mm-hmm. mentally, pro wrestling mentally. So the psychology of pro wrestling and their promos. So those are things that we didn't really do that much where, where I came from. Uh, so physically, we were ahead of those guys. Physically, mm-hmm. I mean, no matter where I went, no matter where I was wrestling, physically, we were ahead of a lot of those guys. Um, but mentally, we weren't. So, you know, and it's not a, it's not a shade on Kowalski at all, but we, we didn't drill that stuff. Like, we mm-hmm. drilled the physical stuff, and we stood out for those reasons. You knew a Kowalski guy when they, when they did what they did in the ring um, because it, it was believable. It was unique. And everything was crisp. 
And that's from repetitions and just being taught the right way to do stuff. Um, but, you know, me personally, I was lacking mentally um, and, you know, promos and stuff like that. And when I went out to UPW, I was able to step that up a, a lot. And I tell my guys now, the psychology of pro wrestling, it's not easy, but the way I explain it to them, it's, it's understandable and you, you kind of get it. So the role of a villain is, is, is to find out what the people want and take it away from them. Mm-hmm. That is your job as a villain. And as a hero is the same, you know, find out what they want and give it to them. That's your job as a hero. That's it's the simplest way uh, to explain it. That doesn't make it easy. It's still, still you gotta, you gotta, you know, yeah. you gotta work, you gotta work yeah. each audience and apply that and figure out, you know, basically like the equation of it. Right. Um, but that is a good place to start. I, I am seeing little girls and I'm talking like eight, 10 years old, screaming bloody murder, like, at Elijah six, I'm seeing yeah. an old lady in her sixties and seventies pointing fingers, screaming and shaking. Dude, yeah. I'm telling you, you might not really see the heat that these kids are bringing, man. It is yeah. amazing yeah. to watch. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, 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 I know, I know, I know from him. I, I, he's got that. He's got that nat- naturally and. You know, yeah. I, I, I I hope he uh, keeps his head on and, and, and keep moving in the right direction. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I've been talking a lot about Tessa's strength. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit more about Sip Wagner Brown because your character, it's a bit, you come out, you're a big guy. You've got, you know, the reggae thing going on. You've got some yeah. bright colors yeah. going on. You do big, giant, impactful moves, but you're smiling every single second of the match and not only that yeah you i love when you do this so much you will poke at ref bill and you'll be like come on you know but like really jazz with the referees and it's not just bill you jazz with all the referees what makes you do those little things with the referees because i absolutely love that stuff well i i it's 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 really it's stuff that we do in training and you know i i apply that (laughs) Live was one of those things where people get a kick out of it, and uh, when wrestlers get a kick out of something, then the audience will get a kick out of it. So I, I, I basically just take stuff that we do behind the scenes and put it on camera, and you know, nine out of ten times it's gonna work. <laughs> I, I tell you that whole referee thing. I love when you do that. It's just like so freaking funny as hell. Uh, <laughs> no, the SWB character Slick Wagner Brown. Has that yeah. always been your name or when you were in your upcoming, you've kind of gone through some stuff and please tell us you were called like blue suede shoes or something wacky back then. Please, <laughs> please, please. I can't tell you that. It's always been my name. Uh, really? I got, I got, yeah. I got the nickname slick, like my first week in the, in the, at Kowalski's. So like, um, I, I was, you know, I, I was an athletic kid. I was very small, but I was very athletic. So Walter would always show me how to do things where guys try to give me something I land on my feet. So uh, one of the students, Trey, the smooth operating gangster, he started calling me Slick. And I didn't have any idea what my character would be or what my name would be in wrestling. And I just I just ran with it. Yeah. So it's always been Slick Wagner Brown from the time you started pretty all the way to now because you are a yeah. very active wrestler and i'm not trying to slight your age but you've been in the game for a bit now my friend uh yes staying in the game being trained not by any joe schmo back in the day i yes. trained by killer kowalski taking all of that training and having to deal with that making a career out of it now you're a couple decades plus deep into your career and you are wrestling as active as i've seen any pretty much any wrestler on the circuit today yeah. Wow. Uh, <laughs> the gym. I'm very curious. The slick train in the gym, like 12 days a week, a thousand hours, uh, 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 like a day, because you've got to keep fit, my friend, because again, yeah. you're on, you're a little older in your career. You've been in the game for a bit. Yeah. Um, I don't, I don't train. I, I try to train like three days a week. I don't go as hard as I used to when I was younger. I, I just do it to, makes me stay stay active 
you know, it's not a cosmetic thing for me for me anymore. It's just be just having myself in in shape where I can do what I what I need to do, and um, it's um, I I love it, man. I I enjoy I enjoy what I do. I've always you know I've always had the same amount of passion for pro wrestling, and you know now I'm. I'm doing both. I'm not going as hard as I have in the past on uh, the the wrestling side for me personally. Um, now it's it's about like you know the future, like the next generation, setting these guys up for success. Yeah, I want to see these guys do well, and you know I've already s- seen that they have they have been progressing much faster than I did when I started out because they have the what they need to do that and. That's one of the biggest takeaways for me is just setting these kids up for success, and, and I, I hope I hope they appreciate it. I hope they they because it's it's weird because they don't know any different. You know what I mean? So all they know is what they're doing right now, mm-hmm. but I know different because I have experienced it. So unless they experience it when they go out in the real world. I don't know if that level of appreciation will truly be there. Well, yes, because, again, I've made some really cool relationships with the men and women that I've been able to network with. And when they they go to different places, they feel the difference from behind the curtain, what the crowds are doing, how they're reacting, how their opponents are in different promotions, you know, the way the feel that how they wrestle, because every place is different. You know, like right. the way you train and, and PAPW and, and, and so forth and so on, bell time and, yeah. and all of that. Yeah. So I, I really think they do because they feel the difference when they leave home, go somewhere else, come back home, start working with the, the familiar men and women. They're like, OK, that's home, <laughs> you know, kind of thing. So right. I think they do right. get it, really. Maybe not all of them, but I think right. they do get it. That's good. That's good. Yeah, man. Uh, now, Test of Strength, I'm curious on the name. What's with the name Test of Strength? Um, it's something that we do physically in the ring, but for me, it was, uh, emo- emotionally and mentally wrestling is not just a physical game. It's a mental and emotional game. So whether things are falling apart in your personal life, you still got to go out there and perform. Um, whether you don't feel like going to the gym, you don't feel like going to train, you don't feel like doing any of those things that you have to do in order mm-hmm. to be successful, you got to do it. You got to suck it up and do it. I have a headache. My back hurts. My leg hurts. It doesn't matter. You have to perform on Saturday, Sunday, Friday, Thursday, whatever it may be, Monday, Tuesday. It doesn't matter. That's still going to be there. So that's where test of strength comes from. So the people who have that strength mentally, not just physically, mentally and emotionally are going to be successful. The ones that can weather the storm. Uh, SOG says I weigh 35 pounds. I don't think I could weather the storm. Um, now, the <laughs> Test of Strength Championships, you guys have some beautiful gold in there. And I want to mention those because yourself, you. Jay Freddy, uh, inaugural champions, The only champion so far. Nobody can dethrone the Kings right now. It's been a crazy-ass ride for us, the fans. I appreciate that ride you've been giving us. I love long reigns. I think they're a thing of the past, and I love a long reign of champions. That's something that you're doing for – I'm being selfish on this one. I love long reigns, so thank you for that one. Uh, But now, you and Jay Freddie make a fan – Before you move on, before you move on, we we got to shout out Alex Rojas for designing and – those titles. It was a collaborative effort, but he came up with with most of it. I just made small changes. The the designs that Mr. Rojas has come up with, and it's not only within Test of Strength, there's even a company that we've already talked about earlier that were some uh, very, very beautiful belts as well. I love yeah. his designs. He does such an amazing job. Uh, yeah. Now, you and Jay Freddie had tearing it up, taking all the competition, beating them all up setting them up for the next opponents, taking those opponents, beating them all up. And it's been in this a kind of a cycle right now. Yeah. Nobody can come against uh, Slick Wagner and Jay Freddy. But on the flip side of that, your big champion, he calls himself Danos. 
His name is Dan yeah. Man. I know yeah. you are very familiar with him in and out of yeah. the ring. Yeah. I did an interview with him for two and a half hours yesterday. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Here, here's the kicker. I mm. talked to a Funko, a, a pop, a Funko pop doll for two and a half MF and hours. He wouldn't <laughs> show his face. Are you kidding me? That sounds like Danos. He's full of himself. Sons of <laughs> bitch. Uh, you he guys really take getting a massage or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even want to know what was going on when he was talking to me. Don't want to know. Uh, you guys, being Jay Freddy and yourself, you take us on yeah. a ride to fans because you're the good guys. And you take right. us on that ride. But now the big champ, Danos, he's a jackass. And he takes us on a different ride. How do yeah. you like seeing Dan the Man, the face of your company right now? Well, you know, he's, he's got a shitty attitude like Tyshawn. And, you know, he's full of himself. But uh, at the end of the day, he's uh, entertaining. Um, he, he does his job. Uh, he gets he, he gets good heat, and people want to see him get beat, and that's that's the name of the game. So who who's gonna step up and stop end this title reign of Dan the Man? Well, who, that, who would you like to see end the title reign of Dan the Man? No, 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 you're not fucking setting me up because Alex <laughs> Rojas did that to me last year, and he mm. he's been canceling Kincaid files ever since with Mister uh, T.J. Howell the second. There's been cease and desist left and right for my show. You have no clue because I mentioned one name. I go, bring in Braun Strowman. And I have been I've been getting heat from Alex Rojas for over a year for that one statement. You're not setting me up. <laughs> not a setup, Kincaid. Come on, step out on a limb. Make a decision. <laughs> Let's go. Well, you know, I mean, I know you have a lot of faces in TOS that you I think that you could probably envision maybe stepping up to Danos. I mean, you're fucking Slick Wagner Brown. I would want to see that first and foremost. I'm putting that out right there. But there's so many men and women out there on this circuit, and I know you know so many of them. I'm going to throw a new one out, and it's going to be a curveball, and I don't think you're going to expect this coming. Yeah. Chris Cannon. I know you know who he is. Chris Chris Cannon. Cannon. Mm-hmm. The fight, the fight. No, no, no. This is the guy in Western Mass, right? Mm-hmm. Chris, Chris Cannon, the military guy. Mm-hmm. You, you want to, you want to see him step up and face Dan the Man. Mm-hmm. You think he has a chance of being a champion? I'm thinking he's only had not that many matches, so his value as a wrestler it might not be up there for a championship. If you want to give him a non-title championship to maybe get that. Hey, that's all well and good if you want to do that. But I'm telling you, Mr. Brown, Mitt Slick, uh, from Mano y Mano, uh, the kid has got some goods. And yeah. I was just saying, I'm just putting it out there. And Slade Dangerfield is going to hate my effing love and guts for saying this. Oh, my God, he's going to fucking give me so much heat. I'm telling you, uh, see see what Chris Cannon could do to one day in a man. You never yeah. might know. You could be surprised. Take a look at him, okay? Just all right. All right. <laughs> we'll do. I'm we'll gonna, do. Dan, the man's going to absolutely laugh his ass off because I just mentioned him. Slay Dangerfield's going to give me fucking lava heat. I, I, I am going to get all sorts of shit from that, just that one statement. But you know what? I don't care. Uh, Mr. <laughs> Slick Wagner Brown, your time has been absolutely uh, so valuable for me today because – I have five interviews. See, I can't even talk, and I'm, I'm only on my first one. I said interviews. Yeah. Holy shit. Uh, I'm only on my first interview. Your laugh, your smile has been very infectious today, and I love seeing that when we get to talk one-on-one. It's all yeah. about the lighter side of wrestling. That's why we do this stuff. I hate right. the negative shit. I really, really hate that negative shit. So we yeah. bring the positive. Look at Slick Smile. I mean, come on, boys. <laughs> why wouldn't we want to have him on? And, and besides, he's Slick Wagner Brown. I mean, come on. We've learned a little bit. I'd like to learn way more and possibly a follow-up in the future if we could ever maybe uh, get some more time from Slick Wagner Brown. We can do that. We got nothing but time right now. Oh, man, that would be amazing. 
Uh, yeah. I am in, I'm like three quarters deep into a hundred interviews in five weeks time. So I'm pushing them out, my friend. <laughs> you're working hard. You're working hard. I am, baby. I am, baby. I'm Bob. You, you're making, you're making, uh, you know, good, good quality of your time, my friend. Thank you. I think so too, because yes. not only do we get to find out information, but I get to hang and talk out to my friends in the wrestling business. And it's been an amazing run and I can't wait for more. I can't wait till wrestling comes back. Uh, when, when we come back, can we just have like a, a fight for your dream slash uh, lone survivor slash just like take five big, the big, huge shows and TOS and make that one event because we got to come back strong, baby. That's true. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, true, man. I, I, uh, I can't wait, but you know, in the, in the interim, uh, people like you that, that, you know, have decided to do the, you know, promos with the men and women that, as you said earlier, put their bodies on the line is, is, is a good thing. So, and you're providing content for people right now. That's a, that's very valuable as well. Thank you. I, I appreciate those kind words because, it's all about love, reciprocating, back and forth. It's that thing we do as a fan, but I got to be a little bit more than a fan over the course, and I enjoy every single minute of all my friendships. I just can't even say enough about how you respect myself when I go to test your strength. Hey, do I? Can I? Can do you mind if I do a promo? It's always a yes. It's never a no, and I respect yeah. that from you guys so much, and I love you for that. Um, your time is way more valuable than mine is because that's that's game day and you guys yeah. are taking time out. So very much more valuable than mine. And I always appreciate that. And you know the thing, uh, and before I let you go, the thing about the test of strength, getting like the very first promo of Elijah Six, uh, getting yes. you know Richard Stone on his upcomings, getting Big Bear at a test of strength event. Dude, that shit to me is way more valuable than finding a Roman Reigns at a big show and trying to talk to him just on the side about something stupid. I love doing it for the brand new upcomers. I think it's so much more enjoyable. I love doing it and I am never going to stop as long as I can keep doing it. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> keep doing what you're doing. We appreciate what you do and we, we, we love it, man. Uh, those footage that you have of what you just said about guys just starting out, one day, some of those guys will be on TV, and you'll you'll have their their very first moments in the business, and that's that's great, dude. That is that's gonna be, now that's money. That right yes. there is money. Yes, <laughs> this has been oh, this is I can't even fucking close up my own show. Uh, <laughs> this is stirring the pot <laughs> with Don Kincaid and my very special guest. Oh, what a pleasure it was today, my very special guest, Slick Wagner Brown. Thank you so much for your time today, sir. You're welcome, Don. Thank you.